The ancestors of these predators hunted in mangrove swamps, back when the continents were only starting to take on the shapes we know today. They survived ice ages and mass extinctions. For tens of millions of years, they reigned over life here, until they faced a terrifying calamity, the development of Florida's coastline. They had no chance, yet these creatures managed to survive in the very places where they faced certain doom. Today, you will learn, does a blue whale resemble a dog? Why do crocodiles boil water? Is it possible to save nature by building industrial zones? And how did the U.S. end up with crocodiles at a nuclear power plant? An incredible rescue story. Crocodiles are some of the most perfectly designed creatures on the planet, going all the way back to their distant ancestors, the crocodilomorphs. And there's not a trace of exaggeration here. In fact, they survived the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. And they didn't just survive, they came through it so well that over the last 65 million years, they've barely changed at all. Not because evolution forgot about them, but because there was simply nothing left to improve. Just to put it in perspective, over that same time, the remnants of dinosaurs degenerated and turned into, well, this. But to be fair, also into this. Or take Pachycetus, for example, a dog-sized creature that once roamed the forests of ancient India. Over time, it turned into, you'll never guess. And you won't believe it, into blue whales. You've probably heard that all life came out of the ocean. Well, it turns out, sometimes it works the other way around. And in a very clever way, the ancestors of Pachycetus evolved and came out of the ocean onto land. But over time, its descendants grew tired of life on land and returned to the sea. And it must be said, they nailed it. After all, we're talking about the largest animal on the planet. Okay, so what about crocodiles? In the 80 million years of their history, crocodiles have slightly shifted the position of their eyes and changed the shape of the scales on their bellies. That's it. Well, almost. How is that possible? Because in the course of evolution, they acquired armor so perfect that evolution itself could take a break. The principle was simple. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. See for yourself. First of all, they're the largest reptiles on the planet. Saltwater crocodiles can weigh up to 2,600 pounds and grow to 23 feet long. Crocodiles and similar reptiles can hold their breath for up to two hours if they stay still. And under extreme conditions, they can even go into a state of torpor. There have been cases of alligators surviving when ponds froze over, with only their nostrils sticking out of the ice. They can produce infrasound, sound below 20 hertz that humans can't hear but can feel on their skin as pressure. Crocodiles send these vibrations through the water for communication, intimidation, and attracting females. It's powerful and even a bit frightening. And here's why. During these special songs of a male crocodile, a standing wave or Faraday wave forms on the water surface. The water literally boils above its back, even if the crocodile itself is submerged. This is caused by the low frequency vibrations. It looks like pure magic. As for bite force, well, we could politely skip that, but let's say it anyway. The saltwater crocodile holds one of the strongest recorded bites in the animal kingdom, around 3,700 pounds per square inch PSI. That's comparable to a great white shark. And just like sharks, crocodiles constantly replace their teeth throughout their lives. They have 66 functional teeth, and over a lifetime, they can replace up to 8,000 of them, a living meat grinder that repairs itself. The crocodile's back and sides are covered with osteoderms, bony plates topped with keratin. So what, you might ask? Who cares about some little bones? What could they protect crocodiles from? Well, not so fast. Even small caliber bullets often ricochet off of them or leave only a dent. It's essentially a natural bulletproof vest, an armor plate inside, and a Kevlar of tough skin outside. A crocodile strike speed during an attack rivals the punching speed of a professional boxer. Prey simply has no time to realize where the toothy jaws came from, before finding itself inside them. And yet, 
this perfect machine for survival and killing almost went extinct because of a weak, hairless, and nearly toothless primate, humans. Of course, not all crocodile species ended up on the brink of extinction, but the American crocodiles definitely did. For millions of years, they lived in the mangrove swamps of southern Florida. It was their perfect world. Brackish water, warm climate, shorelines for nesting. They had no natural enemies. But then humans arrived, and in the blink of an eye, by historical standards, they changed everything beyond recognition. By the 1960s, large-scale urbanization of the coastline was in full swing. Mangroves were being cut down. Shorelines paved over. There were fewer and fewer places where a crocodile could bury its eggs, and more and more places where a convertible could park instead. Houses, supermarkets, endless clubs, parking lots, plus roads, boats, drainage systems. Florida began to look like a resort version of GTA. The cherry on top, crocodile culling for safety. And what was the result? By the mid-1970s, only about 200 American crocodiles were left in all of southern Florida. For reference, that's not few. That's on the edge of extinction. One or two failed nesting seasons, and that's it. Game over. It's mind-blowing. This lineage of crocodiles had survived the asteroid impact, mass extinctions, ice ages, and rising oceans. And it could have all ended over a couple of new parking lots. Crocodiles, being perfect creatures, came up against something even more perfect. Its name is the hairless ape. We say this with a hint of condescension for a reason. The truth is, humans are terrible at being animals. Seriously, without clothing, a knife, a flashlight, Google Maps, and a backpack with snacks, this is no predator, this is someone's lunch. But put a naked, unarmed, unequipped person anywhere, be it in the forest or the field, and see what happens. Crocodiles, on the other hand, are very good at being animals, as you've already seen. And until quite recently, large crocodiles were a threat to humans in many parts of the world. And for a long time, humans had no real way to deal with them. Literally, none. Think about it. It was only during World War II that people began to use on a large scale what would later prove truly effective against large toothy reptiles, a large caliber rifle. Before that, man-eating crocodile stories only multiplied. Some became legends. For example, Bujang Sanong, a man-eating saltwater crocodile, also known as Whiteback. From 1941 to 1992, he terrorized the Looper River on the island of Borneo, Malaysia. He claimed the lives of at least 13 people before finally being killed by locals. Or take another monster, the Nile crocodile known as Gustav, who, according to various estimates, killed anywhere from 60 to 300 people. And he was never caught. Many scientists believe he's still alive. And during World War II, crocodiles once staged an outright massacre for humans. In 1945, on Ramri Island in Burma, Japanese soldiers retreated through mangrove swamps. And according to survivors, crocodiles literally held a feast there. About a thousand men entered, only around 20 came out. This is still considered the largest animal attack on humans in history, and it even made it into the Guinness World Records. Historians debate the scale of the tragedy. Naturalist Bruce Wright, who took part in the battle, wrote of hundreds of dead. But modern research suggests the number was heavily exaggerated, more likely several dozen victims. Still, that keeps the episode high on the list of the darkest encounters between humans and wildlife. So how did such a perfect predator end up on the brink of extinction? Because it ran into something even deadlier, a super predator. And it's not just a figure of speech, it's an actual scientific term. A super predator is a species that not only occupies the top level of the food chain, but also has no natural enemies. Its population is not regulated by any other animal. It influences the balance of the ecosystem, but nothing influences it. Examples of such species include the great white shark, the Amur tiger, the brown bear, and the orca. There aren't many of them, in oceans, jungles, or taiga there's usually just one or two per ecosystem. They're rare and local. But there's one species that became a super predator everywhere, on all continents, in deserts, in mountains, in water, in the air, 
it wipes out creatures that have nothing to do with each other. Wolves, sharks, elephants, whales. Not because it needs to survive, but because it can. Or because it can't help itself. Yes, we're talking about humans, with all their physical frailty. Intelligence turned out to be the ultimate weapon and ultimate defense. More powerful than any claws, teeth, or bulletproof armor. By around the middle of the 20th century, humans had fully cemented this status on our planet. Crocodiles hadn't. Now they lived next to a creature that didn't even need to hunt them. Humans can cause damage indirectly by changing the climate, reshaping the land, altering water composition, and destroying habitats. And even that alone reduces reptile populations. And if you added hunting into the mix, the worst thing you could probably do is put the entire population on the grounds of a nuclear power plant, just to finish them off. Um, funny thing is, you won't believe this. That's exactly what people did. But let's start from the beginning. By the late 1960s, things were looking grim for the American crocodiles in Florida. Only a few hundred remained. There was almost no nesting habitat left. Mangroves were being cut down and the coastline was being developed, and people were pushing crocodiles into the last scraps of livable land. And as if that weren't enough, a new massive construction project began. South of Miami, right on the bay, on the land that was once part of the wild, they started building the Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant. It was Florida's flagship project. It had two reactors, a gas-fired plant, and infrastructure with tens of miles of pipes, service roads, security zones, guard towers, and hangars. The plant required cooling, and to achieve that, they built one of the most unusual systems in the country. These were cooling canals, but not just any canals. They were connected in loops, and if you measured their total length, you'd get 168 miles. That's three times longer than the Panama Canal as if someone had dug a waterway from Miami to Orlando. This was an absolutely unconventional system. Its scale and engineering complexity were unique. Water heated by the reactor's operation constantly circulates through the canals. The temperature can reach up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And no, this water isn't radioactive, although it's tempting to think so. On maps, the whole thing looks like a man-made labyrinth. Concrete, metal, fences, warning signs, Everything is under strict security. Everything sounds like the final nail in the coffin for local wildlife. Only, in reality, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. Just a few years after the launch, in 1978, workers found a nest on one of the embankments along the technical canal. Then another. Then crocodile tracks. Then hatchlings. The plant administration and the management of Florida Power and Light could have easily done nothing about this surprising discovery. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service designated Turkey Point as a critical habitat for a federally protected species. The power company was required to launch a crocodile monitoring program in 1978 and a crocodile management plan in 1983. Thus began FPL's official crocodile protection program the first initiative of its kind ever carried out by an energy infrastructure facility. Since then, every spring, when nesting season begins, biologists patrol the canals. Every day, specialists check the waterways, clear overgrowth, and remove debris. They maintain clean embankments, berms, that are perfect for nesting. If the berms have too many shrubs, they cut them back. If there's too little cover, they create it. Naturally, they search for nests. When they find one, they mark its coordinates, clear the surrounding bushes, and check for safety. Whose safety? The future hatchlings. They protect them from invasive species like the Burmese python, remove snakes, and monitor other wildlife. And when the babies hatch, it's Mike's time to shine. Mike Yorette is a biologist from Miami. From early childhood, he was fascinated by reptiles, and that passion led him to become the lead environmental specialist at the Turkey Point plant. Today, he's responsible for all environmental monitoring, more than 168 miles of canals, and thousands of acres of surrounding land. His team conducts observations, tracks the movements of adult crocodiles via GPS tags, and studies their behavior and health. Yorette also performs weekly vehicle patrols along the interceptor ditch, which runs along the western edge of the canal system. 
he always keeps a notebook handy to record every crocodile encountered. When hatchlings appear, the marking process begins. The procedure takes about five days. The team measures the length and weight of the young and examines their health. Then they get microchip. After that, special cuts are made on the bony scutes of their backs in a unique pattern, like a QR code, different for each individual. Finally, the hatchlings are released back into the wild. The work can be routine at times, but it's essential. Everything is done to monitor the population as accurately as possible and respond promptly to any changes. The team surveys the population in the canals year-round using airboats. When they capture crocodiles, they scan and update existing records, and they microchip any unmarked individuals on the spot. Mike Yoret says the goal of the entire initiative is to maximize the survival chances of young crocodiles. And it must be said, the results are excellent. Since its launch in 1978, the FPL program has tagged more than 8,000 hatchlings. Thanks to careful management and thorough monitoring, the population has grown from a mere 200 individuals to at least 2,000. By 2007, the American crocodile was downgraded from endangered to threatened on the list of federally protected species. Today, Turkey Point is home to about a quarter of all American crocodiles in Florida. In fact, the plant's cooling canals remain one of the main nesting sites for the species. In the 2022 nesting season, a record 33 crocodile nests were found. That same year, more than 500 hatchlings were released into the wild. This story shows us that when engineering expertise and smart environmental management work hand in hand, even a nuclear reactor can become a lifeline. And this is far from the only case when an industrial giant has unexpectedly become an ally of wildlife. Let's take a look at a couple more such examples. An unusual phenomenon was observed at one of America's oldest nuclear power plants, Oyster Creek. Warm water from the cooling system created a kind of permanent thermal shield nearby. In cold weather, it attracted sea turtles and numerous fish like a magnet. Over time, environmentalists noted a significant increase in local wildlife. Turtles began laying eggs near the canal. Small fish started gathering in the warm water zone, creating a local ecosystem around the plant. To be fair, life there wasn't luxurious for everyone. Some other species actually declined in number. The effect was neither constant nor entirely positive, but it was there. With the plant's closure in 2018, the positive side of this effect began to fade. Still, the station is a vivid example of a strange yet successful combination of industrial power and thriving nature. Here's another remarkable story from the other side of the world. At the Lake Liddell coal-fired power station in Australia, cooling was provided via the man-made Lake Liddell. The system discharged heated water into it, keeping the lake warm year-round. Over time, it saw a sharp increase in the number of black swans. They didn't just live there, they bred actively. According to some estimates, the population grew several times larger than in comparable natural lakes in the region. The reasons were clear and simple. Stable warmth, absence of predators, and comfortable nesting conditions. Or how about the idea of an artificial reef? For when you don't have a coral one. In the Gulf of Mexico, dozens of old oil platforms are repurposed as artificial reefs instead of being dismantled. More than 600 platforms have been left on the ocean floor, transforming into coral colonies that attract fish. Red snapper thrives in such places, and crabs, sponges, and other marine species find excellent habitats. A single, typical eight-legged platform can host as many as 12,000 to 14,000 fish. This isn't just a smart practice, it's a nationwide program called Rigs to Reefs. Developed by the U.S. Department of the Interior's Border of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, BSEE. All these examples point to one thing. We are not hopeless. With all our technological progress, we can not only avoid harming nature, but also live with it in an extraordinary symbiosis.